from the city of St. Louis, you're listening to the Don't Push Pause podcast with your hosts, Justin Johnson and Lindsay Reber. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome back, Justin. Hello, everyone. Hey, Lindsay. So happy to be back for this episode. I think you and I have talked about Party Girl many times, but the proper information or enough research and information wasn't out there um, for us to feel like we can have a good grasp on how this movie came to be. Yeah, I think we had the same discussion here with After Hours mm-hmm. where we kept wanting to do it and there just wasn't a proper release with proper special features that we could delve into. And thankfully, Fun City Editions released a great release of Party Girl on Blu-ray, DVD. And so uh, we were able to use some of those special features and really dig into the movie more. And it's been a fun ride. And I'm really glad that we're delving into 90s indie cinema because we occasionally touch on that, but it's something that... Um, we're not shying away from it by any means, but a lot of the movies that we do are big Hollywood productions. And it is really nice to sometimes sit down and watch how 90s indie movies feel and look and have a vibe to them that's uh, totally unique and totally encompassing of that moment in time, that mid-90s where movies were made on 16 millimeter for X amount of 100000 to $300,000 had to be blown up to 35 millimeter to get into Sundance Film Festival and then hopefully get picked up by some sort of distributor. And a lot of stars were born that way. A lot of directors' careers were made that way. And uh, Party Girl is no different. Yes, all of that is true for this film. And I think, too, with Party Girl, it is encompassing of a certain era of that mid-'90s New York spirit that when I was a kid was so inspiring that made me think I could be anything. I could move to New York and do anything that I wanted to do. And even though one might not follow that life path, the spirit behind Party Girl still exists. And it is such an inspiring movie and ends up being kind of a love letter to mid-90s independent cinema as well as um, an era of the kind of like dance party scene Um, that doesn't exist anymore in New York as it was then. Yeah, what's kind of funny with this movie for me is that there's so much nostalgia of this movie tied to 90s independent cinema to me, but not so much the nostalgia that goes on in this movie of like the club scene, Mm -hmm. uh, which is something that I knew nothing about, but Parker Posey was like the, the hub of like indie cinema in the mid 90s. And so Anytime an independent feature came out and had Parker Posey, it's like, oh, it's going to get written up about. And I would read it in like Independent Filmmaker Magazine. And she was sort of the, I mean, I think for like three or four years, like the face of independent cinema. You know, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But when we get into discussing the actors and Parker Posey, and this in and of itself is sort of a uh, Parker Posey episode. Both of our picks of the week are Parker Posey movies. It's no secret. We love her. And if there's someone out there who doesn't, you're probably not going to like this episode, honestly, because we adore Parker Posey. My pick of the week for this episode is an incredibly strange, oddball movie that I have... um, It's hard to describe to people, but it's one of my most favorite Parker Posey movies, and that's called The House of Yes. Such a great pick. Another one of those, like Party Girl, that I discovered when I was working in a video store. It was Waiting for Guffman that turned me on to Parker Posey in the beginning, and then just finding every single Parker Posey movie that I could that the video store um, had. I was like 17 and freaking out about her. Both The House of Yes and Party Girl have stuck with me now for over half my life. Yeah, I really wanted to lean toward one of the Christopher Guest movies that Parker Posey was in but when you said you're doing House of Yes I really wanted to do a movie that was more of Parker Posey not an ensemble piece so Mm -hmm. I went with a newer movie 2012's Price Check we were kind of doing research I was looking up you know top 10 best Parker Posey movies this movie uh, doesn't come up on any of these lists it feels like this movie kind of went under the radar and I think it's one of her I would put it in Parker Posey's like top five best performances as well as being a really great movie. And it also is a very small budget 
movie that went to Sundance. And so it was almost like her going back to her roots. And so I thought it fit really nicely for this episode. That's awesome. I'm trying to think of how many times we've talked about films of hers on this podcast. I've done Clock Watchers as a pick of the week. We definitely stuck with her in the Waiting for Guffman episode. Yeah, and of course, talked about her quite a bit in Days and Confused. Days and Confused, yeah. And I think you and I have had a conversation about possibly Josie and the Pussycats, but she's fantastic in that movie. Yeah, and you know her getting into big budget movies, which is something that she was aspiring to do, but got pigeonholed a little bit as the indie cinema queen. Who would have known the thing that she was loved for actually played against her. So we're going to um, touch on a lot of things with Party Girl. We'll talk about where the original conception for this movie uh, came from, the writer-director team behind this, the themes, the authenticity of this film that feels like it wasn't even trying to, okay, we have to capture this it was like this is just what it is um so the authenticity of the film of course the cast what keeps justin you and i coming back to this movie time and time again and the massively important elements of fashion and music uh, those components in this film certainly play a huge part to why it's so memorable and also man i didn't know about the release of this movie it's kind of nuts i can't wait till we get to that a lot of uh independent film struggles and stories going on in this episode. And a giant first. Yeah. Had no idea. Just just hang around, guys. Well, as always, we'll round things out with our Murray moment after our discussions and picks of the week. But before we get into that first clip from Party Girl, Lindsay, can you give us a brief summary, your interpretation of what this movie's about to kind of kick this thing off? Well, Mary is a 23-year-old New Yorker who prefers to spend her nights amongst her diverse friends out at the club dancing the night away. In some respects, Mary's an entrepreneur, a party planner, an expert raver minus the drugs. On the flip side, she's aimless and might be headed down the same tragic path as her senseless, now-deceased mother. So after Mary's bailed out of jail by her godmother, Judy, facing eviction and with no job, she's forced to confront reality. Judy agrees to hire her goddaughter as a library clerk, which presents even more challenges, balancing a job and Mary's regular party life, which will win out. Can she balance both lifestyles? And if that weren't enough, Mary also begins to fall for a falafel vendor who's keeping her at arm's length. But if Mary's one thing, it's persistent, which will come in handy for not only her love interest in maintaining her library job, but also forcing her to grow up a little and maybe even stepping out of her self-involved life. Well, thank you for that. Let's go into our first clip from Party Girl. We'll be back. We'll talk about how this movie got made. Can I have a falafel with hot sauce, a side order of baba ganoush, and a seltzer, please? Hold the two, please. Okay. Would you like this kind of music? Sure, what kind of music is it? It's, uh, it's from the Middle East. It's a very sad, uh, very beautiful song. Thanks. And uh, for dessert, do you know Lo'om? Uh, no, it's in it. I'm probably allergic to it. I guarantee you're not allergic to Turkish delight. It's it's very, very good. Try it. Are you from Turkey? Me, no. I'm, uh, I'm from Lebanon. So where's Lebanese delight? You want Lebanese delight? Sure, bring it out. Now, as I was watching Party Girl the other night, I was thinking about this, Lindsay, how there's a lot of movies nowadays where being of the times Mm -hmm. is a thing, you know, like Adam McKay doing Don't Look Up or The Big Short talking about the housing crisis. There's a lot of big budget movies that want to approach something that's happening now that's like relevant or topical. And I feel like there was a big period where... um, you didn't. We didn't see a lot of movies like that. But in the '90s, where directors didn't have a big budget, they authenticity or what was happening in their lives at that moment with their friends was what they were writing about because that was something that they knew instinctually what to do and how to make it real. And I, I sort of miss that about '90s movies. Um, we are seeing it a little bit now, but um, on a bigger scale and also like something that's bigger, that's usually topical. That's usually like a quote unquote crisis, not so much like here's what's going on in Louisiana right now with kids in their twenties. Like you don't see too many movies like that. And 
I, I always appreciated these kind of movies like Kids, Party Girl, Reality Bites, where they were really trying to singles. They were trying to tap into something that was like happening at the moment that the movie came out. It wasn't even a reflection on something. Even if the movie came out a year after the scene maybe started fading out, it was still felt very relevant and it's felt very present. Yeah, I think what you're talking about is a personal story, something that people actually, that the writers know something about the world that they're trying to, you know, bring out to people. And, you know, that was that was coming out in Spike Lee films, I think, around this time, which was definitely an inspiration behind Party Girl, that kind of authenticity of the world that director Daisy Von Schulermeyer and Harry Berkmeyer were trying to communicate um, in the script of Party Girl. Both Daisy and Harry went to Wesleyan University, and I think before Party Girl, they had attempted to do one script together, and nothing really ever came of that. Initially, they had this idea with Party Girl because they both knew a little bit about the kind of club scene um, in New York at that time and, and years prior. Now, Party Girl took a good five or six years to actually get to the filming stage and to raise the initial $150,000 to get the movie into production. And before it was Party Girl, they had attempted um, Party Boy, which to me, Party Boy is really just, uh, it's just Jackass. It's a guy from Jackass, and I'd watch a movie with him all day long. But the influences for Party Girl, what would become this film, came from these personal aspects that you're talking about, Justin. Like I said, you know, Daisy and Harry when they were younger, snuck into Studio 54, and that gave them some early exposure to club culture, gay culture, um, things that we see reflected in Party Girl. Along with that, Harry comes at this script from a whole world that I know nothing about, really. And luckily, I do have some friends that have worked in the library for 15 plus years and asked them to watch this movie for authenticity. And they were like, someone did their research. Whoever wrote this did their research as far as being someone who works in a library. And that's true. Harry Berkmeyer's uh, grandmother, both of his grandmothers, uh, were involved with the library, and he hung out there a lot growing up and came to feel very comfortable in a library. His mom had a uh, Master of Library Science, and I think his like sister's best friend in college was a librarian and also a former party girl herself, but funny enough, this story is not based on her, anything to do with her life. So the authenticity as far as the library aspect of Party Girl that's all coming from Harry, and, and that's why there are so many nuanced uh, little aspects in the story that ring very true. For instance, there's a part where Judy, played by Sasha Von Schuller, is saying to Mary about Melville Dewey and how he was a misogynist and being a librarian was thought of as a woman's job, like she goes off for a second. And that came from an interview that Harry and Daisy did with someone who worked in the library system. So along with librarians, um, they also interviewed other folks um, from the club scene, DJs. All of these influences and stories were coming from people that they knew. Harry was also uh, an ESL teacher, English as a second language teacher. So that was the inspiration for Mustafa, played by Omar Townsend, the love interest of Parker Posey. Along with all of those aspects, the Mary and Judy relationship is based on Daisy Von Schulermeyer's mother's relationship with her older sister. And if you haven't figured it out yet, director Daisy Von Schulermeyer and Judy, played by Sasha Von Schuler, that is Daisy's mother. She cast her own mother in a movie, and what a what a bold move. But I think along with doing that, what you're talking about, Justin, having all of these personal influences add to the authenticity behind Party Girl, and that's why it feels almost effortless. It feels like a perfect picture, a time capsule of this moment in 1994-95. And one of the main things I love about this script, and it feels very intentional throughout, is that, uh, like you're saying, we get more into what a librarian does, uh, the secondary characters. I mean, this very much feels like a Parker Posey star making performance type movie. And it also doesn't feel like an ensemble movie, but it also doesn't feel like the side characters are one note, like her roommate. We get a little bit about what he does. Mustafa, we see him more than just the vendor. You know, we go into his backstory, why he came to New York, what's going on with his family back home. Same thing with the character of Judy. You know, she's Parker Posey's godmother and she's running the library, but we get a sense of like where she's coming from, why she's so angry at her, why she's pushing her so hard. 
And we get several scenes of that. And that's the thing is like it feels like a script that really wanted to show um, these characters in the real light, whether or not uh, it was in the good side or the bad side. The, the script doesn't feel like it's judging any of these characters. Um, a lot of what these characters do, you kind of have to take for face value. There are moments in the movie, and I think this is very indicative of a first-time filmmaker and script writer, and we've covered a lot of movies where it's the first feature of a director who went on to do many other works, and there's always like this like strange tonality in these early scripts where they take a character too far, they make a character explode, and Sometimes they don't come back to it. And there's moments of that in this movie, but it still feels like extremely well balanced. And I feel like, um, you know, we're never going off the rails. Like, I feel like I get a sense of like who all these characters are and why they are present in Mary's life, the Parker Posey character, and why we're spending time finding out what's going on with them and then how they're either going to help her or hurt her in her journey to figure out what she wants to do. This whole movie, uh, again, is very much like a movie about someone who's 23 and going through what we all do in our 20s. You know, you're trying to figure out what you want to do with your life. You're starting to understand societal pressure. You're starting to understand um, that no one's here to help you out all the time. And it's a pretty big life change. And, you know, I think that there's moments in the script when I'm watching it as someone in their 40s when you hear Parker Posey say, I think I'm an existentialist. You know, it's easy to roll my eyes, but then I think that's probably some dumb shit I said when I was like 22. (laughs) Yes, totally. So along with Harry and Daisy kind of trading scenes and, um, you know, helping each other write scenes um, and bringing back together to form this cohesive script, there was always this sense of um, keeping it fun, keeping it silly, but creating these what-if situations. What if Mary gets stuck in this situation? So they would come back together, put the script together, and then they eventually brought in a third writer, um, Sheila Gaffney, who helped pare down the story, focus it, and really hone in on what became this film. So with Sheila Gaffney coming in and kind of trimming off the edges, that's why, I mean, when you have three brains that are working together and two of those are really... I mean, they're kind of, they've been friends for a really long time. To me, I also think of Daisy, the director, as Mary a little bit in this film and Mary's best friend, Derek, as Harry. I don't know how much truth there is to that, but that's kind of, uh, the friendship of Mary and Derek seems a little bit like their their relationship. Another thing um, that you might not gleam from this, but what draws me to it is that everyone's an outsider in their own special way. Like Mary's not well off. She's selling her clothes to make rent, which is, I mean, I've done that. I did that in my 20s too, to just sell things that were important to you just to get by. In some ways, that's a rite of passage. All of these characters are the background characters in movies, the ones that don't get enough screen time, the ones whose stories you don't get to hear. That's one aspect of Party Girl that's always had me coming back to it, is that these are all the characters that we get to explore a little bit more. Also, that this is, you know, a quote-unquote woman's picture. Like, this is a story about um, this particular woman's journey. It's actually not about her getting the man at the end of the story. Yes, she and Musafa do end up together, but the point of the movie is not about that. It's about her personal growth. And if you look at it in the sense of uh, this movie was kind of designed with a lot of inspiration of screwball comedies of the 1940s behind it, that puts a lot of things in perspective too. Of course, you have 50 years between the 40s and the 50s and screwball comedies, I love them. I think I just talked about one like two episodes ago. I love a screwball comedy. But when you put it in the place of the 90s, you can see that influence, but you also see the gritty realness that was independent filmmaking of the 90s and of this particular world in Party Girl. And to just kind of focus real quickly on what I consider the two main characters who are Mary and Judy, there were some criticisms about the script initially, and that was that both the character of Mary was a bit unlikable, as was Judy, that she was pretty brash. And, you know, you and I have talked about this off the mic. While I get, you know, the unlikable aspects of Mary, maybe it's just my love of Parker Posey that she maybe makes me overlook 
um, the terribleness of being 23 and being really self-involved and not being able to think outside of yourself or have the forethought to maybe get a job so you don't have to sell all of your belongings in order to make rent. All of these selfish qualities that I'm, I know that I had at 23 and that annoy me now about 23 year olds. But to have a character that is unlikable yet likable is treading a really like fine line, I think, to make it work. And I agree, like, uh, you know, there's something about Parker Posey that kind of makes you like look past yeah. <laughs> uh, some of these things where if, if this character was played by somebody more mean spirited, I think it would be hard to stay on board and have them be likable. But I do think that the relationship between her and Judy is so interesting in this movie. And to me, it feels the most realistic out of all the relationships in this film is because we have a movie where. Uh, and when I watched this when I was younger, I thought the character Judy, I was like, God, why is she so mean, the Parker Posey's character? And now that I'm older and watching it, just like, oh, well, you know, the, her character is like pretty right on. You know, she's frustrated with her. She's frustrated that Mary won't take responsibility at the job. She's frustrated that she doesn't respect the library. She's frustrated that she doesn't respect the fact that she's a young woman who's like entering into a profession. And to me, what makes this unique is that in a lot of movies, when a character gets called out, you know, like how Parker Posey gets called out in this movie by Judy, she's getting called out by someone who's not her mother. It's her godmother, but it's someone who Parker Posey is like trying to eventually impress or like get a, you know, keep her job there. But it's not, she's not getting called out by a friend who's her same age, which is generally the case in movies like this. There's a blow up scene mm -hmm. and then that person gets called out and they get told everything that they do wrong. And because we have a movie where it's someone who has experience calls Parker Posey out. And at first you are like, God, that's you're really harsh. And then they have a heart to heart later that feels very natural. It gets hashed out. It's not just a scene to put some excitement in the movie. It all comes back around and grounds her character. And so I, I really like that they spend time on this relationship. And then again, it's not like a, a throwaway moment where she's mean and that gives her the the determination to well no one's going to tell me I can't do something and then you know sure they throw in a montage of her like trying to learn stuff and you know it's she picks an amazing montage yeah 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 and then like you know refines her uh librarian skills along the way but we come back to the Judy character and we find out that you know she's going through menopause and that she's feels a little bit of resentment because she's been, you know, become more cynical with the world. And she knows the history of like how women were put down in her generation. And Parker Posey seems blind to that. And there's a little bit of, I think, jealousy of Judy not being able to live in that world where she doesn't have to carry that around with her so much. And before we go to another clip, I wanted to talk briefly about this movie it's like a lot of movies that we do on this podcast have these like long shooting schedules and all kinds of stuff happen during pre-production and production the story of how they got it made <laughs> um bef you know in the success after the movie is always like the the talk of the movie because generally they there's not a lot of production discussion because it was made so quickly in this um, falls right in line with that. This movie was, they shot for like 20 days. Um, the budget was $150,000 and budgets were talked about with so much seriousness in the nineties because you had to shoot on 16 millimeter. I mean, nowadays you can shoot with your phone and get a great image. I mean, you can, they have prosumer cameras that are really great that shoot 4k during the nineties. You, if you wanted it to be a legitimate film, you had to shoot it on 16 millimeter and then you had to pay for a blow up to 35 millimeter to get into Sundance and Sundance starting in the late eighties became like a launching pad for feature filmmakers. If you wanted to be an indie filmmaker and then get into the business, you know, Steven Soderbergh, like you mentioned earlier, Spike Lee, Richard Linklater, Kevin Smith, Tarantino, most of all these filmmakers started by making a movie for a small amount by funds, however they had to get the money together, you know, privately funded or fundraisers or 
got an independent producer who raised some funds somewhere. But $150,000 didn't go a long way because film costs so much money. So most of the money was put into, we have to raise money so that we can buy film stock so that we can rent a 16 millimeter camera in Inagra, you know, reel to reel tape with a microphone and like all this stuff that doesn't, no one uses anymore, but it's very archaic. But at the time that was the only way to make as close as you could to like a legitimate looking film. And of course, when you watch this now, it looks like extremely low budget. I mean, you could, they have like filters now that you can put on your phone that look like 16 millimeter. It's kind of funny. You also have to think about when you have a limited amount of money and film stock for the actors, you've got to be able to get these in just a few takes. And that was one thing that Parker Posey said that she remembers most vividly about Party Girl was that you know what you need to do because you've got like two or yeah. three takes max. And generally these movies took so long raising the money that sometimes the the actors had a lot of time to rehearse. And, you know, so by the time they went to shoot, knowing that they're only going to get one or two takes, they would have to nail it on camera. One thing about this, the production of this movie that I really find to be impressive is that because they used real locations and used a lot of real club people, a lot of times when I watch an independent film from the 90s, the first thing I notice is like the blocking, like the background action that's going on um, behind a lot of the characters. No one really knows like what really to do. You just they're, <laughs> they're not given any of that yeah. direction. So you have the forefront of what's going on, but the background just kind of looks like, I don't know, just go over here, you know, especially party scene a lot of times. They just, whoever they could get to show up, and then it doesn't look like a real party scene. And all these feel very authentic. I've never been to a club like this in that time period, but like it feels like everything going on in the background and everything that everybody's doing feels authentic to that moment. So that it was well researched, and they did at least bring people on to act in background and do things in the background that felt like uh, they really wanted the party sequences to seem like they're really going on. And I think that is like a real um, triumph for this movie, especially for how small of a budget that they had. And so that that way, when we did get to those scenes and the movie itself is called Party Girl, you, you need like at least three or four parties going <laughs> on in this movie. And what the the vibe was at the time for you have a live DJ and you have loud club music. The only thing that uh, I didn't, that I was when I was rewatching this because it had been a while, I was kind of shocked at how uh, that there's like no drug use going on because, you know, it was the 90s. And, you know, when you think of like raves and club scenes of the 90s, you think everybody's on ecstasy or doing coke in the bathroom. And you don't really see any of that in this movie. And uh, it didn't feel like it was like, omitted for any conservative reason whatsoever it just uh not everybody did coke and not everybody did drugs you know so this was just a character that didn't partake and her friends were you know people were drinking but it, nothing seemed uh like some like excessiveness of someone ODing in the club or in an alley somewhere you didn't get any of that in this movie but again it it does fit with its light-hearted tone I think that goes along with the film's authenticity is that because Parker Posey herself was a club kid I saw her on a, I think it was a Conan O'Brien interview um, during this time where she, you know, said, yeah, I'm, I'm the girl that goes out. That's how people know me. And I'm also not going out and doing drugs. I'm really just going out because I like to dance. I've always loved to dance. That's what I like to do. So her being like party girl uh, in the beginning adds to that authenticity and using her friends and even some of Harry and Daisy's friends in these scenes that adds to as an ensemble, everyone looking like a cohesive unit. And there are even some people that Parker Posey knew, for instance, who she had inside jokes with. And you see that a couple times whenever you see actor uh, Dwight Ewell. Um, there's a few times that they have interactions and each one of those are inside jokes that they had as you know, just people out in yeah. the world. We'll get to the music of Party Girl a little bit later, but um, before we do, before we get to the next discussion, there's something that I think is really important for this film, and I'm so glad that Daisy and Harry got the music supervisor, Bill Coleman, for this film, um, because he said one of the things that drives him crazy about watching films as, as a music guy, someone who's been a music writer his whole life, is watching a movie where people aren't dancing to the beat. So he wanted to make sure that the music that he was selecting for Party Girl, that when they were filming these scenes, that they either had the piece of music that was going to be in that scene and was going to be played on set when they were filming, 
or something that could at least match the same beat. He's like, I can't watch anything. It drives me absolutely crazy when things aren't on beat. And I totally agree with him. It's a really great point. And you do see that in a lot of movies where you can tell whatever they were playing nope. on set was not what ended up in the final movie. If they were playing anything at all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's stop there. We'll go to another clip from Party Girl. We'll be back. We'll talk about the cast of characters, more on the music, and on the uh, release of this film. You were just randomly putting that book on the shelf. Is that it? You've just given us a great idea. I mean, why are we wasting our time with the Dewey Decimal System when your system is so much easier, much easier? We'll just put the books anywhere. Hear that, everybody? Our friend here has given us a great idea. We'll just put the books any damn place we choose. We don't care, right? Isn't that right? You haven't taken a break all morning. Take a break. I just want to do a good job, Howard. You are doing a good job. Take a break. I'll cover. Take a break. Starting off talking about Parker Posey, if you are listening to this episode and you're like, who is Parker Posey? Or, you know, you, you've heard of her, but you have never really seen like, this is a movie starring Parker Posey, which to be honest, in the 90s, as much as she's known as like a 90s icon, really Party Girl and a few other movies where she's a central character. Most of the 90s she had, it was like an ensemble piece or she played a smaller part in multitude of indie 90s movies. Um, just for those that are in the know or not in the know, regardless, there's a filmmaker called Hal Hartley. She worked with him uh, numerous times. Uh, I've watched just about all of his 90s movies, and they're pretty eccentric, pretty dark, but also wildly funny at times and interesting, um, worth checking out. But I was just going to read off some titles. This is 90s era Parker Posey, How Many Movies She's In, starting in 94, Sleep With Me, Amateur, Mixed Nuts, The Doom Generation, Party Girl That Came Out in 95, Drunks, Frisk, Flirt, Kicking and Screaming, The Day Trippers, Basquiat, Waiting for Guffman, Suburbia, The House of Yes, Clock Watchers, Henry Fool, Dinner at Fred's, and most of these movies played at Sundance. Most of them she either had like a bit part in or like a larger role, a co-starring role. Some of these there's a handful that I hadn't heard of or hadn't seen. It's it's wild when you think about because it, it was really only like three years, but she has in interviews has said that kind of hurt her career because she at one point desperately wanted to break into Hollywood films. And I think she even used the example of like, let me just play Matt Damon's ex-wife in an action movie where I get three scenes and they just labeled her to quote unquote indie. It's weird how those kind of politics work because I don't know if anyone didn't know who Parker Posey was in the 90s. Um, if she showed up in a movie, I mean, they wouldn't know who that person is. I don't think they would attach some sort of like indie stigma to it if you're watching it but in 1998 she did finally get into the Hollywood system and was had a substantial part in the movie You Got Mail which was a huge hit with Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan when uh, they were doing their uh, rom-com domination and I think she was in Sleepless in Seattle but she was cut out of it yeah I think so and then I think a lot of people came to be aware of Parker Posey through Scream 3 because that franchise kind of blew up and was really successful. Her career kind of then was like a mix between notable big movies like The Sweetest Thing or Superman Returns, Blade Trinity, um, but then would balance that out with doing a movie with Christopher Guest or doing like an indie film or like like the one I'm doing is my pick of the week, 2012's Price Check. So she kind of went back and forth between Hollywood movies and independent films, which I think a lot of, there's a lot of actors that we really appreciate, character actors that live in that um, area like Steve Buscemi, you know, where they, it's like a fine balance. Like they'll do a bigger movie to pay for their mortgage or their rent. And then they can do more indie minded movies where th maybe they have a bigger role and it's a meteor role. But I'd honestly identified this movie as her number one signature role where you get the essence of Parker Posey as a person, um, all the little things that she brings to a role and that free spiritedness off the mic. We were kind of talking for a moment uh, you brought up this, uh, the Manic Pixie Dream Girl, which was a trope that came out, I think, around the time, uh, maybe it predated this, but around the time of uh, Garden State would, 
Natalie Portman of this like quirky, very attractive woman who seems like damaged in some way, who seems obtainable. And then usually it's, you know, some like pretty basic dude is able to <laughs> start some sort of relationship with her that goes off the rails. I think predating that would be like Patricia Arquette and True Romance. Some people have mentioned Party Girl in that discussion. I don't think it fits, but like I, I definitely get the uh, the magnetic energy of this character of where even if she is doing something questionable as far as like maybe from a moral standpoint, you know, she's still such like a interesting character to be around and has so much energy coming off of her that you just feel sort of like happy to be in her presence and like knowing that, oh, this night's going to be more exciting because this person walked in the room and things are going to get more lively. It's not just going to be like a ho-hum basic sort of night. And I think that that's the energy that she brings to the party girl character that's on the surface level. And then as the movie progresses, you know, you see her battling her own decisions and what she wants, like her ideals about who she wants to be in the future of her character. Yeah, her character of Mary is not stupid. She's resourceful, um, but I think the only thing that she has working against her is her age and just that idea of, I won't say everyone, but what a lot of people feel like uh, when you feel aimless is that you're just kind of a loser and you're down on yourself. And Mary has that, and that's an attribute that makes us root for her is the fact that she's not well off, that she is aimless, that she knows that she can do better. And that's, I mean, part of the reason that she challenges her godmother, Judy, and says, you think I can't be a library clerk? Well, I'll show you. Yeah, I can. And then finds out, oh, I actually like doing this and I want to be better. But the quirkiness that Parker Posey brings to the character of Mary, I kind of started with her audition. And she wasn't on, um, I, I don't think she was on any list and she hadn't come in for the audition for this film. In fact, Party Girl went into pre-production before they ever had a lead, which would make your filmmakers completely panicky when you're not finding someone who, I mean, it's called Party Girl. We're focused on one person who's leading this story and it has to be somebody that grabs you. It was a casting director who was a, a casting consultant on this film, Laura Rosenthal, who threw Parker Posey's name into this. And both of the writers and Daisy, the director, were like, Parker who? I've never heard of her. And at that point, Parker Posey had done, she had a recurring role on the soap opera As the World Turns. And let's see, she had a bit part in Coneheads. That might have been the first time, actually, I think I saw her and registered who was that? You know, but she it's a not a blink and you miss it part, but a very, very small part. And then she had been making a name for herself in the party scene in New York, but also in Dazed and Confused. And even though her part in that movie is small, I mean, Air Raid Bitches is one of the most quoted lines from that movie, which of course comes from her character. So Laura Rosenthal throws her name into this and contacts her agent. Parker Posey's agent gets her the script. And as soon as she gets this, she's not, I think she's visiting her family in Louisiana or something at the time. And she freaks out and just says, I have 80 pairs of shoes. Like I am party girl. I need to audition for this. So she shows up to the audition and it just couldn't have worked out better for her. There's a reason that the front of the poster says, Parker Posey is party girl because she showed up to that audition in platform heels, shorts with a total dazed and confused vibe and a shirt that said dance, dance, dance on it, a, a clear locket that had a cigarette butt in it and a script in one hand and iced tea in the other hand and she just nailed it. She knocked it out of the park and pretty much Daisy and Harry knew in that audition that they found their Mary and Daisy said, you know, it's not customary when someone leaves an audition or you tell them in the audition, you've got it, you've totally nailed it. But she said they were so excited, you know, they're in pre-production, they were so excited that they found her, she wanted to tell her right then. And so I think Daisy said she didn't even wait a day, like she called her later that night and said, I want to do this with you and if you're on board, we're going to move forward. So along with Parker nailing the audition and bringing the character, just emanating the character, Fortunately, she also loved to dance, she loved music, and had an extensive wardrobe, loved fashion. Just everything that Parker brought to this showed how excited she was. And at that point, she got it and they could move on. Now, Parker Posey went to college for 
drama and she was kind of like a pretty big drama nerd and hearing Parker Posey talk about how uh, her approach to doing Mary was way more methodical than I would ever think because it just seems like she just is Mary but she was diagramming her sentences and called herself a really big nerd on how she went over the script she said her script was just lined with pages of notes about blocking and her movement and how she was going to say lines she was a fan of screwball comedies too so planning out how she was going to approach Mary was really important and um I think Daisy and Harry weren't really even prepared for how much she was going to bring to this character. There were only a few times I think that Daisy and Parker butted heads because Daisy really wanted to stick to the script as it was, word for word, stick right to it. And Daisy Von Schulermeyer was 28, I believe, when she directed this. So they're both fairly young. And this is your baby. You've been working on this for five or six years you think every word is is perfect and if someone deviates from that you might get a little offended you know um parker posey liked to improv and she was really good at it and she would throw out lines and you know get them knocked down but there are some things that she did bring to the script some ad libs a lot in club scenes and um the voguing that we see i love the voguing scene that's all parker posey that wasn't in the script in the library scene she does a cartwheel and picks up a book at the same time it's effortless it's just absolutely beautiful and that was all parker posey so for the amount of dialogue maybe that daisy didn't let parker have in the film she was able to bring a lot of physicality to the movie And just watching all of the Christopher Guest movies that Parker Posey has been in, you see the range that she has is so wide with the different characters that, you know, and his his comedies are, when we talked about this when we did Waiting for Guffman, improvised, but they take a lot of ideas and they write them down and they work on them. But she brings so much to each one of those characters, and they're so varied from movie to movie. uh, When she's working with Christopher Guest, but has that style of like you don't, you know it her character seems like someone they pulled off the street and just started rolling on her because it seems so authentic to that situation or that person. And she has that very natural style where you just, whatever role she's in, you 100% believe that this person is like living and breathing. It doesn't feel like a carbon copy or like a sketch of a character even if the role's really small it's like embedded in her face and her the way she talks and the way she pronounces words um all these little subtle things but like at the end of the movie you're like man that was really like such a great performance and you know so many movies I watch and it's just like especially I think actors that kind of do the same sort of movie over and over again you, you know you can see it looks a little sluggish sometimes I never really get that sense whenever you see her she kind of jumps off the screen and makes for like a better scene when I first saw Josie and the Pussycats and saw that she was in it I was like oh man I don't know how I feel about this and I I mean I love that movie actually and her performance in that film goes through so many different evolutions and I think is a really great example of of seeing how versatile she is in, in just one role because it is kind of a very, very manic role. And I wanted to pivot a little bit just to talk a little bit about the other actors in this movie. Generally, we go a lot longer on this, but as with a lot of independent films, a lot of times the acting isn't bad, but they get actors who are not as nuanced, who haven't had as much experience, you know, performances that are like almost there or not as authentic. I think this movie does like a pretty good job working with what it has. You know, the character of Mustafa, this was his only role that he ever played, but they needed someone that looked the part and felt authentic. And he's a little stiff at times, but I think overall like does a pretty good job. Again, this is sort of the trials of like doing a movie for no money. Um, You have to tap into resources and find actors that fit the part. You don't have this huge list of notable seasoned uh, professionals that you can pull from at all times, especially for like little bitty roles. In the character of Mustafa, Omar Townsend, Harry and Daisy really wanted to stick to 
him being Lebanese and they were having such a hard time finding an actor for this role. People were saying, can't you just get like an Italian guy or someone who's Hispanic? And Harry was like sticking hard to this idea of the immigrant experience and someone being authentic to this role. Because even though it's not like the biggest story undercurrent in Party Girl, Mustafa's character's experience is very important in his relationship to Mary and his scene that he has with Leo played by Guillermo Diaz, um, there are a lot of important aspects. Like Mustafa is, you know, he's struggling and he, like he says in, you know, in Lebanon, he was a teacher and, but here in America, all he can do is be a falafel vendor and he doesn't know how to take the next step and becomes, you know, later on in the film helped by Mary in that respect. But I think it's important for his character. We need to see that him having this real life struggle witnessing all of this american selfishness is something that's really important for the script and like i said it's not something that's in your face like you know daisy and harry are teaching us about the immigrant experience it still is something that's unique for 1995 and i like that it's an actor that we don't know we've never seen him before and the only real criteria was that he had to be really attractive, which he nails. And I think Omar Townsend does a great job in this role. At no time do I feel like, oh, this guy's a bad actor or anything. He just seems like he seems like a dude, like a, a dude that you would just meet on the street. Yeah, he f- feels like a real life person that they found that fit that description to yeah. a bill and didn't push him too hard to, you know, they put him in situations that were authentic to him and... I also like too that they're that Mary and Mustafa's relationship don't feel trivial. You know, there's a little bit of culture clash, but it's not played for laughs. And in the end, it's probably the the lowest point of her character of like them getting into it is like the party that she throws near the end. And she's like, no, it's funny that you're serving falafels to people, you know, and it's like it feels real raw, you know, and they have this little fight that happens, but it still feels real because, you know, he would be angered about that. And at the same time, she is sort of wrapped up in her own world and she's intoxicated by the fact that she's with somebody who is so foreign to her. She's probably dated guys that are all the same a million times. And this is someone that's has different ideals and is more mature and has an idea of like who he is and who he wants to be. That's really, I think, worked out in a very short amount of time in this movie. I mean, it's like runs like 90 minutes, but I feel like we get enough of their relationship and see where they're coming from to where, you know, you you do kind of hope that they're going to be together at the end and help each other out. And even though Mary's character is, this would be a culturally insensitive moment by having Mustafa serve falafel at a rave. No one's going to be eating falafel and she has in there as a novelty. We see that the next day after the party's over, Mustafa has a string, a line of people waiting to get falafel at his stand. And it's not something that's overtly said that Mary helped him by getting that business and he's the joke in the movie is that he's standing across the street from another falafel vendor and they're doing really well and his business is failing but even though it's coming off of a slightly culturally insensitive moment we see that there was some help that happened there and not saying that you know Mary's swooping in and and helping everyone but it is a little bit that he did gain something positive at least from that experience. And since I already brought him up, Leo, played by Guillermo Diaz, this was his third movie. He's certainly really well known nowadays, uh, but he was only 17 when he read for this role, which is nuts. He doesn't look 17 to me, uh, but came in for the audition and did it with Parker Posey. And I guess she grabbed the script out of his hand and like threw it out of his hand and they kind of improvised their scenes together and it worked really well. Harry and Daisy were really stoked about his audition. Um, but he was really green to this world. He'd been, like I said, only in two movies before this, very small roles, but was green to this culture and the world of Party Girl. So there were a lot of people that ended up being mentors during that time and became so afterwards. Um, I loved learning that Bill Coleman, the music supervisor, taught him basically like how to look like a DJ, how to look legit. And the DJ experience isn't explored all too much in this movie, but Leo did need to look like he knew what he was doing. Even though he was nervous and trying to break into the scene and make a name for himself, we needed to believe 
that he could do that, that he was a good DJ. And I think uh, the addition to Leo's story of like the ultimate nightmare when you're a DJ is that you lose the beat or you can't switch over to the next song in a, in a seamless way. I mean, it's beautifully played out in the film and um, yeah, makes me never want to be a DJ, honestly. And I do think the relationship between him and Parker Posey's character, they do feel like roommates. They have that early 20s where she's helping him out. There's a moment where she pisses him off and then there's a moment where they're making out in the shower. It's like they have all these... But that moment moment where she says, incest. (laughs) Yeah. Again, like uh, this movie being Parker Posey's movie, but like giving Leo his scene, you know, and showing why he wants to be a DJ and, you know, what the struggle is of like trying to break into a club and like having to do a tryout, not getting paid. And then like having to keep all his records organized and like knowing, you know, what the vibe of the crowd's going to be. And like you said, we're not getting the full perspective of what it's like to be a DJ in the nineties, but we get a little bit of a taste of it and it feels authentic enough for the environment in which, you know, the movie takes place in. And because this is Mary's story, that it comes back around to Mary ultimately helping him become a better DJ by introducing him to the Dewey Decimal System and and categorizing all of his 2000 albums. Which makes for a funny yet frustrating scene (laughs) because uh, that's the one moment where uh, I'd be like, man, if I came home and like some, my roommate had like reorganized all my movies, I would be like extremely (laughs) frustrated. And then what wouldn't make me less frustrated if they're like, well, don't you know, the Dewey Decimal System, how well it's going to help you. I'd be like Leo in the movie. I'd be like, oh my God, I fucking hate you right now. Yeah. Guillermo Diaz is awesome in that scene. It's probably my favorite one is when he's so mad about it. Yeah. Well, moving on to Leo Shriver, who probably now is one of the bigger names of the movie Party Girl. When this movie came out, he had been in a few independent films and was already, I think, like as far as independent circles and theater circles, like his name was known and or at least I got the impression through interviews that the director and writer were thankful to be getting him in this movie. He's more known now for like television work like Ray Donovan, but here he's doing a, a British accent, which, you know, it's a little rusty. It, it is. It's, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's funny because he's one of the more seasoned people in the movie, but comes off a little stiff and his character is probably the most like one note. He just sort of seems like a total douche and, you know, someone that Mary dated at some point in time, but because he's connected to the club she goes to, she humors him along the way. He is in one scene that I think is like the only moment in the movie where the tone shifts super dark, where he sexually, you know, tries to sexually assault Mary. He's at first nice and then tries to make moves on her. And they take the scene pretty far. Like it gets, he gets pretty aggressive and scary. And, you know, there's nothing funny about the situation. Like they play it pretty straight And then, uh, you know, we don't see his character again after that. He does do that part very effectively. I think maybe it was the uh, British accent that was like hurting me with watching his performance. That scene is, we need that to understand how much of a piece of shit that Nigel is. It starts off like, oh, he's going to take care of Mary because she's on something and is having a terrible night. And then it just somersaults into the worst thing possible. But it's part of the whole idea is that Mary needs to shed herself of bad influences and bad people in her life in order to become a better person. Uh, Liev also went to high school with Daisy von Schuler Mayer. Uh, so this was kind of a favor, I guess, that he, he did this. Um, it, it's funny to me that he's the, you know, he was the actor of the whole New York uh, circuit at that point in I guess Parker Posey found out too that he thought she was kind of an idiot um, and they ended up being really good friends. I think even before they were in Mixed Nuts together and then he's in Day Trippers, right? Yeah, they're in Day Trippers yeah, they're together. In Day Trippers yeah, together. just like a year after this. Yeah. So I like his addition to this film, um, but I he is somebody that I kind of forget is in it until it happens because he is such a like big name now. Another important character is uh, Renee Donna Mitchell, who's the club owner. 
Um, she's pretty hard, and uh, we find out later that she's a struggling alcoholic. Donna was a former supermodel. I didn't know that about her. She was definitely a familiar face to me through TV and just random parts and movies. Just has a very memorable face to me. I didn't remember her being in The Exorcist, but I guess that was like her first film role. She's one of the early party goers. More remembered her from uh, random television shows, and um, most recently, I think, in Olive Kittredge which I love that series. The character of Renee wasn't based on anyone, even though there was a lot of speculation since a lot of interviews were conducted about the club scene, but Renee was not apparently based on anyone. But I do really admire Donna's bold choice to go as far as she does and extreme as she is. Justin, you said off the mic that Renee, there's a part when um, she says to Leo, you can't play any records by Teddy Rogers and to impress a girl leo plays the record that this girl venus gives him uh to play and it's produced by teddy rogers and renee freaks out breaks a bottle holds it to his throat and it seems nuts like it's it it's that moment of whoa is this movie taking a different tonal shift and then you find out that she's a struggling alcoholic but maybe had we known that before it would be a little different but i kind of like that we find it out afterwards it makes a little bit more sense but i think donna mitchell knocks it out of the park with this role yeah she has those crazy eyes (laughs) yeah and for being someone who is so beautiful um and you know a former supermodel she has an air of still like this essence of being untouchable but like not too beautiful that you put her on some pedestal like she is a hard woman you know i i like that i like that about her character Another hard woman um, would be, we've already talked about her um, quite a bit already, is Judy, played by Sasha Van Schuler, the director's mother. What a bold choice to cast your mother. You have to expect that there are going to be some problems. And evidently, Daisy can talk about this in hindsight, but didn't think about it at the time. But she was kind of embarrassed of her mom because Sasha was very theatrical and evidently very joyous. And, um, you know, Judy's a pretty hard woman and very strict, uh, but Sasha was just a joy to be around. Daisy said that there were... Uh, times when she was embarrassed of her mom's theatrical ways and doing some improvising um, so much so that she would you know be really hard on her and Parker Posey and the rest of the cast would basically be like just let her go she's amazing you need to get off her back Um, and I'm sure that they resolved their their issues she's wonderful in this movie um, but I cannot imagine casting my mother in a film it was a really great choice because she looks the part of, you know, I mean, she has a very intimidating stance about her and a no nonsense stance and looks like someone who would be the head of a library is put in a supervisor position and also is going to judge her goddaughter quite harshly at times. The first time I watched it, I did feel like, man, this is a really, um, she's really going for it. Like it's a big performance. It's not, uh, you know, she's like shouting and like getting stirred up, but then kind of watching the movie a little bit more and seeing their relationship unfold, you kind of, it fits, you know, that anger and that pent up aggression, not being afraid to bring the hammer down on Mary and say, you know, you need to get your life together. If you want to work here, otherwise you're just like wasting my time and wasting, you know, your coworkers time. There was a brief moment when money for the production was slim and, Daisy thought that she was going to need to recast her mom and told her this, recast her with a bigger name um, in order to just get funding. And Daisy tried to go after Joanne Woodward, um, who turned down the role. But man, Sasha said that she was so hurt and offended that she was possibly going to be recast for this role. This is, again, playing into the idea of I could never cast my mother because this is something you might have to confront if you're a director. But thankfully, I mean, no shade on Joanne Woodward, like phenomenal actress, but I'm very thankful that Sasha Van Schuler was in this film. Yeah. And she was no stranger to, she had been in soap operas and she had worked in theater for like years and years and years. So um, she was bringing a more theatrical approach to it, but was a very seasoned performer and not afraid to perform in front of a camera or work with a bunch of actors in the scene and have it be believable. 
There was a really funny story that Daisy said um, because there was that, you know, a little bit of tension, mother daughter tension on set that like years after Sasha passed away, Parker Posey said that she would sneak cigarettes with Sasha when Daisy didn't know about it. So Daisy didn't know that Sasha smoked, but conversely, Parker would also sneak cigarettes with Daisy and Sasha didn't know that Daisy smoked. So basically she's smoking cigarettes with these two family members and they're both hiding it from each other. I thought that was a really cute story. Well, next to the characters being very authentic and diverse in Party Girl, the music is essentially important. And this was a time period where there was a lot of, especially in New York, so many different types of music that were popular um, hip hop, house music, reggae, reggaeton. I mean, so many different sub genres of genres that we know where if you weren't listening to a usually like an independent radio station where they're telling you what this stuff is, it'd be lost on you if you only listened to like mainstream music. And in the mid 90s, I mean, I was just like maybe just starting to experiment listening to trip hop because it was entering into the mainstream. A lot of the music I think in this movie uh, wasn't entering into the mainstream necessarily like house music. It was like in certain scenes and the club scene, but the directors made a good choice. They were not aware of all these different styles of music and they wanted it to be authentic to the kind of music that would play out throughout the movie and not just have only house music playing or have like roll beat playing. So they said, you know, we need to find someone who knows this music, who understands the difference between musical genres and understands like what these characters, you know, can watch the movie and say, you know, this is what you need to do. Here's the kind of music you need to play over these scenes. And bringing Bill Coleman in as the music supervisor, I mean, the guy had been living and breathing music his entire life. At this point in his career, he had just left his uh, writing job at Billboard as the singles editor to uh, manage Delight, who does have a song on the soundtrack. And I think it's mentioned that it would have been criminal to not include Delight on the soundtrack, which, yes, definitely during this time. So Bill Coleman was already a figure in this scene. And music is such an important character in this film that there are moments where the song is telling us what's happening in the scene. Um, specifically, there's one, um, a song called uh, I'll Keep Coming Back by Chanel, where Mary is refusing to leave Mustafa alone after she accidentally stood him up. Um, and I don't mind that. Like sometimes in movies, it does bother me when the song's telling me what's happening. But because of the spirit behind this movie and because it's overall really positive, um, I don't mind it. It just makes it even more fun, actually, to experience it. You did mention the score behind this, and there is one. Bill Coleman felt like it needed to have a little bit of George Gershwin like feel behind it. And it is. It's, it's lively, fun, curious, a little flirtatious at times, but exciting. And is also a throwback to that kind of old movie style, which is what everyone seems like they were on the same page about. This was coming off of 40s screwball old movie style. And Bill Coleman really was honed in on uh, the spirit behind every facet of Party Girl. And I really can't stress enough how big of a deal that is for an independent film because you, if you go back and watch some movies from the 90s, you can tell that they just didn't have a budget. So they were like, you know, I know my friend plays music and I'm going to get that person to do some a score of some sort or they want particular songs but they can't get them. So like, what can we find that's sort of like that? Or it's some, you know, they try to find something that's like, license free and it's like some weird little jazzy piece that doesn't fit with the movie but we need music on it so again it's it's nice that time was taken and money was spent to authenticate music that fit the universe that all these characters are living in and another smart move by getting bill coleman was not only did he get delight for the soundtrack because he managed them but many other people on the soundtrack were artists from his uh production company peace biscuit so 
I mean, it's it's helping everybody. It's helping Coleman get his artists out there and also help filling out the soundtrack with great artists. And another uh, big name on this soundtrack is Tom Tom Club. They weren't able to afford the song that they wanted, but because Coleman was friends with them, he basically just asked them, do you mind coming up with a song that no one's ever heard for this movie? And they had no problem with that. I mean, that's pretty friggin' cool. Oh yeah, the soundtrack's on Spotify. If you if, if you don't have a copy out there, it's on Spotify. Another big aspect to this film is the entire fashion sense, the look of the film, the costume design that was curated by Tom Clancy and his assistant, uh, Vicki Bartlett, who regularly get name dropped when talking about the fashion in this film. Now, not only did Parker Posey use her own clothes, we talked about her having kind of a fashion obsession, and she was connected to the New York fashion scene, but pretty much Parker did um, invent her her character's fashion sense in this film. Michael Clancy and Vicki Bartlett borrowed from their friends in the fashion world, including Todd Oldham. Many of the actors brought their own, you know, they were already creative dressers to begin with, so they just, you know, probably brought what they wore to the club the night before uh, for filming. But it seemed like a really collaborative effort between the costume designer and locals and people just from the scene that the filmmakers were asking people you know, bring what you have. Let's see if we can get, you know, a Jean-Paul Gaultier sweater, which they did. I think that was one of the pieces they made sure to say that that one was returned. It was probably the most expensive piece on the set, but there's a Chanel suit and, you know, these rhinestone sequin shorts. And you have to think about this too, that this wasn't during a time when you could email photos back and forth. You know, is this going to work for the character? Is this what we want to do? Michael Clancy had to be present, you know, with Parker Posey to get fitted, look at these things and personally pick out what was going to work. There was a lot of legwork involved in this. When you have a small budget and you're not just going to roll in a rack of clothes to work on a character that was as much as a fashionista as Mary is in this film. And I think another thing that makes Mary's character so special and shows the level of authenticity is that, again, Mary's not well off. She might live in New York, but she's like barely making it, you know? Her fashion is a lot of the high-low fashion where we have, you know, a Chanel suit, but that's mixed with something that was $3 at the thrift store. Though I'm not that person, um, it's not my fashion sense, I've been friends with a lot of people who are. And there is a certain level of artistry that I've seen with people that I've known who do mix something that is expensive with something that's vintage or um, just, you know, might be a piece of crap to one person, but you put it with this, you pair it with this amazing number, and it's something that no one's ever seen. And the fashion is really just such a character in this film, and having everybody in the film work together to to make such a collaborative um, costume design for the whole picture. I love the community effort behind it. The platforms that she's wearing in the montage library scene where she's figuring out the Dewey Decimal System and dancing, those platforms were ones that she auditioned in. I love that fun fact. Well, now like I mentioned earlier, in the 90s, if you did an independent film and you shot in 16 millimeter, your, your goal was Sundance. You know, like if we can get to Sundance and we get recognition, then hopefully someone will pick up our movie and buy it. And there were a lot of success stories that came out of Sundance, even in the mid 90s, where you heard about movies like a bidding war started, you know, over a movie. And or, you know, they'd be like, this is the Sundance favorite. Or, you know, even in movie magazines, you would see these are the movies to watch because generally, You'd, you'd see what was hitting Sundance and what won awards or what were the favorites, and then you'd start looking for those either if they went straight to home video or like your independent cinema house. And Party Girl premiered at Sundance. It didn't win any awards, but it was, it seemed, at least from the research, it sounded like people that were at Sundance really liked the movie. They thought that it was lively. Um, it wasn't a... Uh, you know, really dark, serious movie where some, a lot of times movies that would win at Sundance dealt with darker subjects or were like really depressing. This was a movie that when you watched it, I don't think you would have thought this has mainstream appeal. I think some movies that came out of Sundance, especially toward the mid to late nineties, they were trying to make them a little more polished. You know, it was a becoming less indie, but 
those movies were generally the ones that would like get scooped up and be on like 500 screens where this was a movie that did not get the success of other movies at Sundance, though it did get some notoriety there. I mean, I certainly heard about it because it played at Sundance, but they didn't get the success that I think they were hoping for when they first hit the Sundance scene. Like Justin said, in order to get into Sundance, you had to have your 16 millimeter film blown up to 35 millimeter, but they were out of money at this point. So they had to try to shop this movie around and they went to Miramax who turned them down, not thinking that this movie had mainstream appeal. There were other companies that turned them down, but luckily uh, First Look Pictures picked it up pretty much immediately and they sold it for $30,000 and I think doubled the budget, maybe a little bit more, which allowed them to blow the picture up to 35 millimeter and also uh, gave them the ability to license bigger songs that they weren't able to get, like Mama Told Me Not to Come, which is what the movie starts out with. Um, So thankfully, if it weren't for First Look Pictures, this film would have never made it to Sundance and Daisy Von Schulermeyer would have just been sitting around with canisters of film and nowhere to go. Um, So yes, it premiered at Sundance. Um, It was an audience favorite. It didn't win an audience award, but was an audience favorite. But Party Girls premiere premiere, the first time that the masses could see this film was actually on the internet this was the first online it wasn't known as streaming at the time but this was the first movie first feature film to ever be streamed online which is nuts and it was kind of a big deal at the time there was a segment on you know i think it was like nbc's nightly news that's out there on youtube but in 1995 just think of it businesses on the web were just starting the internet was new and a friend of mine who works in the library said that Party Girl encompasses a time right before everything in the library changed, right before everything really went over to the internet. He said that, you know, two years later, this would be a completely different movie. But to have your low-budget, independent film do this, um, like, first thing ever, I mean, I can't think of something for a movie in this situation for it to have an extra boost in visibility and getting people excited about it and total fun fact and I don't think it was intentional but Party Girl scooped the movie Hackers which arguably might be more well known I'm pretty sure it's probably more well known than Party Girl but Hackers was planning on being the first movie to ever be streamed online which you know makes sense but it makes me really happy that Party Girl scooped them even though I love Hackers. It's wild to me that this happened in 1995. And when it did premiere, it premiered in black and white. So that was one thing that was different. But Parker Posey did an introduction of the film. She was the one that hit the play button to get it going. And this movie did premiere in theaters, too. It was uh, June 9th of 95. Um, It was definitely not a hit. As far as what I can glean from people who went and saw the movie, really loved it. But ultimately, it kind of was a disappointment, even though it completely made its budget back. Um, I mean, not complete, like pretty much broke even as far as when First Look Pictures put more money into it. It did, I think, break $500,000. So it was not a success, but it wasn't a bomb. I think for the filmmakers, they wanted it to be something more, obviously. But since 1995, there's no doubt that Party Girl has become a cult movie. Librarians love this movie. I think anybody who's an outsider or grew up um, understanding what it was like to be 23 and in Mary's situation loves this movie. Certainly anyone who um, is a longtime New Yorker, I can imagine loving Party Girl too. A lot of Parker Posey movies, including this, whenever the independent film channel became a uh, IFC, like you could get it, you know, it cost extra with a cable package. But I knew someone that had IFC and it's like, oh, man, they're playing all of these like, you know, 90s cult movies, um, including Party Girl and like Doom Generation and all that. And um, so it was still getting played, you know, even years later. Um, And then, of course, I think I saw it rented it on VHS, you know, eventually in some video stores. They'd have the indie cult section and that's where you'd find the Parker Posey movies. Basically why I got hired at a video store was that I was renting the movies no one else was, which Party Girl was one of those. Well, let's stop there. We'll come back with some final thoughts on Party Girl at the end of the episode. But let's get into our Parker Posey picks of the week. I went with Price Check, but Lindsay, what can you tell me about The House of Yes? 
This one holds a special place in my heart because I discovered this rare treasure on my own as a teen working at a video store. It felt like a secret that I alone knew because if not, why aren't more people talking about this oddball film? It's weird, off-putting, supremely dark humor, controversial. I just don't think 1997 audiences knew how to handle The House of Yes. The poster for the film only shows Parker Posey coyly in an over-the-shoulder shot wearing Jackie Onassis Kennedy's iconic pink Chanel suit with a pillbox hat. This, combined with Posey hiding a revolver behind her back, makes the allusion to the John Kennedy Jr. murder. Just the cover is already coming at us with depraved humor. It's so irreverent, and if this, along with unsettling situations, causes you to chuckle, then the house of yes might just be for you. Thanksgiving, 1983. A hurricane has descended upon a massive Virginia family mansion. This is where we'll stay for the entire film, with a primary cast of only five. Structured after the Wendy McLeod play of the same name, director Mark Waters adapted the story for the screen. This is also Waters' featured directorial debut, but he's probably best known from the much later to come film Mean Girls. The Pascal family have a flair for the dramatics and quick-witted humor, and the root of this story does not unveil itself immediately. The family leaves breadcrumbs all around for us to piece together this puzzle. Siblings Jackie O, played by Parker Posey, and Anthony, played by Freddie Prince Jr., and their mother, Genevieve Bujold, eagerly await the arrival of one absent Pascal sibling, Marty, played by Josh Hamilton. The instant frenzy dialogue with a healthy dose of leading paranoia shared between Jackie O and Anthony is the first clue that this family is functioning on normalized high anxiety. Jackie O is teeming with excitement. Marty's her fraternal twin who she overly adores. So when Anthony opens the can of worms that Marty is bringing home a fiancé named Leslie, played by Tori Spelling, Jackie O's thin veil of sanity begins to slip and a sick twinship connection takes hold. There's no one who can deliver Jackie O's hyperactivity, instability, cutting comments, and frequent mini-outbursts quite like Parker Posey. I've been over the edge, and now I'm back, is how Jackie describes her mental health struggles, saying that she does normal things like read books about assassinations and just watch soap operas all day. That's her normal day. Through sharing memories and coded interactions, fragments of decade-old family stories begin to create a picture, a rippling undercurrent of something we know not. We, like Leslie, the fiancé, are just trying to figure out this odd family dynamic. It's the peculiar closeness of the family, the intimacy, the frankness which begins to raise hairs on your neck. When Mrs. Pascal describes to Leslie the birth of twins Jackie and Marty, she says, Jackie came out holding Marty's penis. It's in some medical journal somewhere, as if this is a normal thing to say to your soon-to-be daughter-in-law. There are many pointed, headcock-worthy precursors to this family secret, And since this film is 27 years old, there really can't be any spoilers anymore, so here goes. It's really nuts how much incest becomes the front and center subject of the film. Once the secret of Jackie and her brother Marty having sex for most of their adolescent young adult years is revealed, Jackie's emotional instability suddenly makes more sense. But like her, Marty was also unable to tear himself away from his sister, but when he finally did... Jackie almost killed him, literally. We don't see this in the movie, but it is understood through the stories that we hear throughout the film. And when this is your subject matter, or wherever any type of film deals with something so socially reprehensible, taboo, unacceptable, your story and performances better keep you hooked, because this could veer into icky territory real quickly. The House of Yes's sharp-tongued dialogue accented with a high degree of sarcasm and an intimidating intelligence has an outsider like poor Leslie, this obviously small-town girl, feeling even more off-balance and out of place. She's never been to a mansion, she's never known people like the Pascal, so for all she knows, these people are normal. The back-and-forth ping-pong match of dialogue feels like a modernization of a 40s screwball comedy, except with a leching, unhealthy, and haunting backstory. Posey's portrayal of the extremely clever Jackie O steals the film. She never seems like a parody of a woman with mental health problems. We feel her anguish, her inability, or brattiness, depending on your viewpoint, about wanting to never leave Marty. She wants to reveal and spoil her brother's engagement. To her, Marty's hers, her twin, her everything. She's aware of social norms, as is Marty, but her willing mental block allows her to slide right past what Marty's wife will soon be horrified by. Posey easily serves up Jackie O's manipulative ways, turning her awkward phrases and manner of speaking into nothing less than an art form. Thankfully, Posey doesn't overshadow the rest of this small cast, but certainly functions as the glue that keeps it all together. 
Next for me is Freddie Prince Jr. He filmed this right before I Know What You Did Last Summer, not making a splash on the Hollywood scene until then. Prince's performance has me questioning him the whole time, settling on accepting his slight dopiness. But luckily for Prince, Anthony is not as one-dimensional as he appears in the beginning. And Josh Hamilton, this actor always has some type of darkness behind those doll-like eyes of his, so I think he's really great casting in this part. There has to be a twinge of emptiness behind those eyes of a sibling being controlled by his twinship and stunted emotional growth. Genevieve Bujold, who plays Mrs. Pascal, her scenes tell you everything about where these siblings learn their detachment, their inability to take responsibility. She's siphoned down the manipulative tendencies to her children, and instead of dealing with their weaknesses, hers included, everything is meant to just gloss over that which they let slide, meaning that everybody knows what was going on between Jackie O and Marty. And Tori Spelling, she got a lot of flack for this role. People claim that she only got it because her father, Aaron Spelling, fully funded the film, and maybe she did. But if someone is going to play a naive and innocent woman, kind, uncomfortable, but accommodating, Spelling delivers here. I also think that her style of acting is served well in a play-to-movie type of setting, especially in one that rests on the shoulders of a fully exaggerated lead like Posey's Jackie O. A very honorable mention goes to Rachel Lee Cook as the young Jackie O. Her time is limited, but viewing this younger version of Posey's character through the video camera lens held by a young, enthralled Marty, the visuals of Cook transport us into another time, to where it all began, to where this kind of sickness of this twinship all started. Dysfunction is normalized in the Pascal family. A young woman's obsession with a historic tragic incident which influences the rest of her life is accepted within these Virginia mansion walls for over 20 years. Stunted adolescent growth is at the forefront here. How memories affect us for the rest of our lives is glaringly obvious. There's a certain sickness to the house of yes, but all kinds of people exist in the world, especially with questionable family dynamics. And as wild as this film gets, it's probably not all that far-fetched. Yeah, I agree. After 27 years uh, revealing the big secret of the House of Yes, uh, doesn't seem like much of a spoiler, but (laughs) it is still shocking when you watch it today. Yeah, definitely. And I have a feeling that the House of Yes is a stark difference um, from your pick of the week, that being price check, right? Yeah. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? All right. This movie, Price Check, came out in 2012, and this feels very much like the early 90s independent cinema where you can tell the budget is really low, but the script is really sharp, the characters are really well-defined, and that's what makes the movie exciting. There's not a ton of polish, but you can see that someone was able to make a really good movie that was exciting and entertaining to watch with a limited budget. The story to this is relatively simple. We have uh, Pete, played by Eric Mabus. He works in the pricing department, which the movie sort of looks, it looks like a corporate job. I mean, they all work in an office, but they work in the pricing department of a sort of like mid-chain grocery store. And the movie talks a lot about how much he gets paid and where he lives. I think that's a big part of the story is that he makes $40,000 a year. They have a three-year-old child. His wife isn't currently working, but they own a house. You can definitely tell this movie was made 10 or 15 years ago before inflation took over. Um, Some of the stuff that they talk about this now, you're like, what? He makes $40,000 a year and they own a house and she doesn't have to work. It's funny how much that's commented on in this movie um, with the suggestion that he needs to make more money. And that plays a big part in it. He's struggling because he doesn't really like his job. He used to work in the music industry, but he couldn't make enough money. And now, like many movies where you see a character locked in place, they're in the suburbs, they're backed against the wall, they have a mortgage now, they have a kid, they're married, but they're feeling empty inside. That's sort of the direction of the movie, but the movie takes a left turn whenever Parker Posey enters the picture. She takes over their division. She's um, fast talking, very aggressive, knows the business and immediately fires somebody and makes Pete the vice president of his division. At first, he doesn't really want all the extra work, but then he finds out he's going to be making double what he used to make and that changes his life. And so he's pretty happy in the beginning. Parker Posey's on fire in this movie. She's very aggressive. And at first she really shakes up the movie and you're excited, but eventually she becomes very controlling of Pete. Their professional relationship eventually crosses the line. And that's where the movie, um, it has that sort of like stress anxiety of like, man, this guy's in so deep. How's he going to 
turn this around. And so there's these levels of the movie, which the script does really well, which it builds up the stress in his life. And then it gives the audience a little bit of a relief. You know, something good happens to him. Uh, He's able to overcome something at his work, but then they ramp up the tension with his poor decision making with his life. And it almost becomes explosive. Like a lot of indie movies, I wasn't really a big fan of how this movie wrapped up, but I still think it's worth the ride because Parker Posey, this is the kind of role that she's totally built for. Um, This is the unhinged, manic, sort of uh, charming, all-in-one, you know, where you you see her enter a scene and you're like, that person's, they're going to like command the room. And she does that time and time again in this movie. Um, There's several scenes that are absolutely memorable and I think some of the best of Parker Posey doing what Parker Posey does best. And this movie, uh, I found it uh, streaming free on Tubi with ads. So if it's still there, worth checking out if you haven't seen or heard of it, 2012's price check. I don't know how this one has escaped me because I feel like I've seen so many Parker Posey movies. And I love Eric Mabius. I admittedly probably know him from The L Word. But Dolly Hall, I also saw produce this, and she produced a boatload of... 90s movies that I, independent 90s movies that I love too. I got to check this one out. Thank you, Justin. I, I need an, a new Parker Posey movie to watch. It's it's so uh, easy to go back and rewatch every movie that you love her in. Yeah. But sometimes you miss the ones that you're like, oh yeah, I haven't seen that one. Well, those are Parker Posey picks, House of Yes and Price Check. Here's your Murray moment. <laughs> Chicks dig me because I rarely wear underwear, and when I do, it's usually something unusual. I think I need a root canal. I'm sure I need a long, slow root canal. You're gonna come and shake my monkey tree again? Oh, what does that old queen know? She didn't even show. Okay, this is so scrumptious. Is this hand shot? The flowing robes, the grace, all striking. That was fun. Party Girl is so New York centered and it had me thinking back to our last city centric episode for After Hours. Billy Murray might be a Chicago boy, but a huge part of his formative years were on SNL from 77 to 1980. Not all, but most of the SNL cast did their fair share of partying, even at some clubs that Party Girls Mary or even Parker Posey herself would have frequented. While we'll stick to the party vibe for this Murray moment, this connection is more party girl filming location based, which was all in lower Manhattan. In the same area, two decades earlier, near Canal Street, was the refuge for Billy and other SNL cast and crew members post-show tapings. Less than two miles and only two turns away, this refuge was called the Blues Bar. I brought it up in the After Hours Murray moment, but let's dig a little deeper. I was one of those blues bar people, Bill said in the James Andrew Miller and Tom Shales incredible novel Live from New York. I stayed until the sun came up, he continued. You had to blow off a lot of steam. You had this amazing performance high that lasted because it had built to this explosive point at an odd hour for a normal person's day, between 11 and 1 a.m. You couldn't really just say goodnight and go home and go to sleep. You were just up for hours. The first blues bar opened its doors in 1977. The space was rented and run by Billy's partners in comedy, Danny Aykroyd and John Belushi. Party Girl's Mary character would have highly approved of the blues bar, even though it might have been a little too grimy for her taste. There was a semi-official after-show party for the cast, crew, writers, hosts, musical guests, but it would often and inevitably be infiltrated by folks who weren't from the show. You couldn't just go anywhere to an ordinary place because there were a lot of people who would just crash it, Billy said. We wanted just the inner circle, Danny Aykroyd said, so we needed a bar where we could entertain. You can't just go home and go to bed. You had all this energy and this uplift and a place where you had to work it off, and the Blues Bar provided that where you could dance, drink, be funny, and meet up with a lot of people and just carry on, Bill said. It was a necessary place to go. Donning a tiny stage littered with instruments begging for anyone to play, offset by a stock jukebox with vintage R&B, sometimes a Rolling Stone or an Allman Brother would just stop in and jam, or you could find a random celeb, even tending bar. 
According to Bill, mostly everyone had this, quote, weird energy after taping and that you weren't fit for normal people, explaining that they had to go somewhere where they'd all be in a safe place. And Billy, Danny, John were all adamant about creating this safe space for this band of weirdos. And while non-SNL folks were totally allowed in, if you created a problem, it was not tolerated. If someone was bothering you, every person that was already in the bar was a bouncer, Bill said. You've got to go. Sometimes people being kicked out by these comedians thought it was all a joke. They'd think they could just walk away from you and be like, no, it's all right, man. I won't bother you anymore. No, no, no. You're not going to bother anybody anymore, Bill said. The ladies of the cast were always strongly protected by their male counterparts and protected heavily at the blues bar. If they felt uncomfortable, they'd just say, Danny, Billy, this guy, he's out. And they'd get tossed to the curb. Some of these inappropriate guests were famous, too. But blue-collar equality and safety was of the utmost importance. Not of much importance was, well, the cleanliness of the blues bar. Friend of the bunch and SNL host Robin Williams didn't know what he was getting into when Danny brought him down to the bar post-show. Don't be afraid, Robin. Just uh, step inside. There's amazing people, wonderful music. Just step inside, Danny said to Robin. And Robin went on to say, it was like funky. That's a good word. The old sense of, was that a rat? Maybe. SNL cast member Lorraine Newman probably described it best. The toilet in the blues bar was the filthiest toilet anywhere. It was so vile, and the walls had water damage and were peeling, and the stank was unbelievable. The floor was always wet, completely wet, wadded up tissue on the floor, she said. And yet, it was a fun hang, a windowless hole with lots of cool music people and the stink band, named such because they stank, too, Newman said. The Stank Band could be made up of Belushi, Aykroyd, or Billy, of course, plus various guests from Keith Richards, David Bowie, James Taylor, any musician who played the show that night or any friend of the SNL crew could very well be playing live at the bar that night. And from the After Hours Murray moment, we learned that the Grateful Dead were welcome anytime. Not every cast member or host partook in the all-night letting off of steam. They were wild, Dan and John, said the recurrent host and SNL friend Steve Martin. I never went down to the bar. I wasn't that kind of guy. Steve said this after describing running into Danny one afternoon, all black and blue, saying that he'd just gotten pushed out of a moving taxi. I didn't even know where the blues bar was, said the wonderfully grounding force to the SNL cast, Gene Curtin. Longtime Billy and SNL friend Penny Marshall viewed the blues bar differently. While she admits the dive was a total zoo, everyone partying and getting famous at the same time was scary, she saw the protective nature it created. We held on to each other desperately because we trusted each other, and hanging out with each other, we knew we weren't going to also tell on each other. For an incredible Murray moment involving Penny Marshall, please check out episode 21's tribute to her. We were really just trying to get down to a safe level so you could sleep. Because you really couldn't sleep until 6 in the morning no matter what you did, Billy said. SNL writer Rosie Schuster remembers the blues bar similar to Billy, as the cast needing to blow off steam, but she also had the viewpoint of a woman who could hang tough with Danny, Billy, and Belushi. It was like the boys' fantasies of the blues, and then a heavy saturation of the blues, and then, having played out in TV sketches, suddenly there was this manifestation, and they were really inhabiting these characters. Those parties were pretty intense and wonderful. It was just great music and dancing. Schuster said she remembers that time very fondly and feels really privileged to have seen so many characters explode. The one she'd seen perform that night on the show, these characters were at the blues bar just being realized. It was like you were buzzing. You'd get turbocharged from this intense effort. And then there's like this adrenal burnout later, Schuster said. I remember even sleeping at the blues bar. You'd go in, it was dark, Newman said, and you'd come out and it was dawn. There was a second blues bar in Chicago, but we'll keep this Murray moment to Party Girl's Lower Manhattan stomping grounds that also happens to harbor this SNL history. But if you want another 70s party story involving Billy and the SNL crew, please check out episode 46's Murray moment in the Andy Warhol episode. I can only imagine the debauchery that went on. I remember working in a bar for six or seven years, and I would get home at like 2.30 because we'd close down at 1.30, but then Every now and then we would leave after we closed down the bar, we'd head to like a three o'clock bar. Yeah. And I just always remember that scene being like, wow, this is the late night partiers where people just are so inebriated. There's just any kind of normal conversation is just out the door. You just kind of look over at a sea of it just looks like something that you you, you only see at a three o'clock bar. It's just like a particular vibe that 
is uh, scary and exciting all at the same time. Yeah. And then I'm sure if you throw them out of cocaine, you get <laughs> what, what these guys were doing. You know, not everybody was doing cocaine, but it was, it was going around. But, you know, I, I not that I would say performing on SNL, I would equate it with being in the service industry. But for normal people, I could kind of see that a little bit because working in the service industry, you are functioning at a, at a whole other level of just being amped and constantly on. And then when you don't have to be anymore, you do have to blow off steam. And it is kind of like the same thing just on a like normal person scale, yeah. you know. And yes, you're completely right. For anyone who's not worked a service industry job or maybe not been on SNL, um, it doesn't happen all the time. But sometimes you're out really late and you're like, Man, this this night's never going to end. It's going to be it's yeah. going to be dawn before I get home. But you're okay with it. I think yeah. when that happens. Yeah, it's a fun time. Yeah, it can be. Well, thank you for that Murray moment. Do we have any final thoughts on Party Girl or Parker Posey before we close this thing out? Yeah, a couple final thoughts. I don't know if many people saw or are aware that Party Girl was developed into a sitcom. Very very short lived sitcom. There were six episodes that were filmed. Only four aired. You can see. I think last time I checked two episodes on YouTube. It starred Christine Taylor and Susie Kurtz. You know, it, it is the over-the-top sitcom version of something that wasn't meant to be as um, as flashy of a comedy, is what the sitcom ended up being. Originally, the writers, Daisy and Harry, uh, went to Fox and suggested that the story be about Mary and her best friend, Derek, um, which kind of would have been the relationship of Daisy and Harry, like, as woman her gay best friend but a cooler version uh fox hated the idea and we're like absolutely not we can have a gay actor but they can't feel gay um like kind of like they compared it to bewitched i think and then two years later what happened um will and grace came out um so there was this you know coded or not even coded just overt homophobia of like we're not going to have an overtly gay character also another slap in the face was that Daisy's mom, Sasha, her godmother in the movie, was cast as the Susie Kurtz character, and she was fired after one day. Um, just kind of an all-around big bummer for Daisy and Harry. Daisy said that it was a pretty heartbreaking and disastrous time for them. The two episodes that I've seen, I've got nothing. I've got no problems with Christine Taylor or Susie Kurtz. If you love the movie, it um it doesn't do the original story justice. It's interesting. There's been several movies that in the '90s where they tried that, where they tried to parlay them into some sort of TV series that usually had a pilot and then three episodes, and then it would get canceled. Because I think, especially to a lot of these movies, the free spiritedness of some of these movies don't translate well into that weird bubble of like sitcom TV. Yeah. Um, it's just uh, you really need to go broad. It seems like with sitcom television, or else it ends up getting canceled. People give it like one 30 minute episodes. And if, if they're like, I don't like this character, then it just, it falls flat. And the Mary character is so superficial and they try to, in the first episode, they kind of try to make her a little bit more, she's figuring things out about herself, but the people that she surrounds herself are, it is the, it's the dumbed down version of the movie. And it's kind of insulting to the movie. There was this television series that came out about 10 or 12 years ago called don't trust the bitch in apartment 23 with Kristen Ritter, which I remember when that came out. I think it only lasted a season, but I did enjoy it. But the whole time watching it, her character kept reminding me of Parker Posey and Party Girl and how that particular version of a show worked where you have a conservative roommate and she moves in with the Kristen Ritter character who's very reminiscent of Parker Posey. And that character is always like getting her into trouble and is very edgy and is always looking for the fastest way to have a good time even if it means uh, disrupting other people's lives and also not having a um, moral dilemma about it. Thank you so much for drawing that comparison. I can't believe I didn't think of that before because I watched that show and for being someone that's not really drawn anymore to network sitcoms, that one got me and I was legit bummed out when it got canceled. Yeah, it never seems like the edgier stuff seems to work and then it drums up some occult following, but... Now, nowadays, if it drummed up a cult following, some streaming service would be like, well, let's go back and do it. You know, yes. we'll, we'll, we'll restart it up. But fortunately, back then, they just didn't weren't doing that yet. I bet in 20 years they are going to do a reboot of that. You know, before we close out, Justin, I feel like um, 
I have to ask you, do you have a favorite quote or anything from the movie? Because I have I have a couple things that uh, always make me chuckle when I think of Party Girl as far as, far as one-liners. Every time I think of Party Girl, I just think of a voice shouting at me saying, recode it. <laughs> recode it! Or what about, can I get a falafel with hot sauce, a side order, a bob ganoush, and a seltzer, please? How about, I'd like a nice, mind-altering substance, preferably something that will make my unborn children grow gills. <laughs> and uh, the gay classic, he hello, come on. What's up? The rent, and I'm not paying. <laughs> Anyway, we love Party Girl, and we hope that if you haven't seen the movie, that this will draw you to wanting to seek out this incredible independent film. Yeah, it's worth your time, and I'm really glad that we got to delve into some uh, mid-90s independent cinema. Next month, we're going to be doing another sort of uh, growing cult classic, and that's Donnie Darko with a young Jake Gyllenhaal. And this is a movie that I didn't like when it came out, and um, it's really grown on me, and I'm excited for us to watch it multiple times and have a discussion about it. I resisted this movie for a long time when it came out, and then when I finally watched it, I resisted it because guys in college were freaking out about it, and I'm like, I'll never watch it, ever. And then I finally did, and I was like, I get it, yeah. I find sometimes it's uh, watching movies where the you're you're separated from the hype Mm -hmm. and uh i recently the the dune one the one that came out like two or three years ago Mm -hmm. i uh, watched it for the very first time uh recently and it was nice to kind of watch it away from all the hype of people saying this is the greatest sci-fi movie ever made and just sit down and watch it away from all that years removed from that and i feel like i can just enjoy things a little bit better because i I'm, i'm guilty of i get caught up in hype very easily and it happens time and time again where I get caught up in the hype I get real pumped up I go see some movie opening weekend and the movie doesn't live up to the hype that I've built up in my head so I find sometimes if there's early early hype I just wait it out and then I'll watch it on my own terms I know that's a me problem but it's the way I operate and it's the way I can enjoy movies more I'm thankful that you get caught up in the hype because that's how I learn things. You have your uh, finger on the pulse of what's hot and what's not way more than what I do. Just because I have insomnia and I'm just like (laughs) scrolling through uh, Facebook film movie feeds all night long. You're doing that and I'm like scrolling through TV, regular TV. I'm like, oh, there's a marathon of the alien movies. Let's rewatch those for the 38,000th time. I'm always (laughs) just like reading like 500 comments about people saying this is the greatest film ever made. Yep, and I'm watching Monster in Law. You yeah. know, that's I got a problem. Thanks, Justin, for keeping me hip. Yeah. I appreciate it. I, I try. I try. Well, thanks again for listening. Until next time, I'm Justin Johnson. And I'm Lindsay Reaper. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you, guys. <laughs>